thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America. Today, we are thrilled to have with us Rebecca Carroll, the writer and social critic and one of our most important voices today, appearing in print in the LA Times and The Guardian. She's also the author of a thousand books. Uh, I know what uh, red clay looks like, the voice and vision of black women writers. Saving the Race, Sugar in the Raw, and Uncle Tom or New Negro. Rebecca has also launched a great conversation series on WNYC, How I Got Over Reinventing Language Around Race. We're so glad you're here. And, and you also have that magnificent podcast, you know, There Goes the Neighborhood, right. you know, which is timely as everything that you do is uh, talking about changing neighborhoods. Yes. Well, thank you um, for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, the podcast, There Goes the Neighborhood. So um, about a year ago, WMYC um, invited me to come uh, and join the newsroom as a, um, a producer of uh, special, proje special projects on race. Right. Um, and so the central project was this podcast, which is dealing with um, gentrification in central Brooklyn. Um, and so when I first ap approached the idea, <clears throat> you know, and I have been in Brooklyn for 20 20 plus years and had watched it change and I've lived in almost every neighborhood in Brooklyn. Um, but when I first started thinking about how to approach gentrification, I thought, how is, how is this going to be interesting? Mm. You know, because it's sort of, it's sort of a, a simple story on the face of it. And right? it's everyone's story. And it's story, everyone's right, story, right, yes. Right, right. But so when I started to talk with folks and interview folks and, um, and, and the voices uh, appears at the, wa at, the, at the top, of the, the waterfall with all those voices, but I did an interview with a, with a, uh, a young black woman in, uh, in Bed-Stuy, and, um, and she said to me, you know, uh, she told me this anecdote about um, uh, meeting up, coming in contact with this um, elderly black man who had been in the neighborhood. They'd both been in the neighborhood, and this man said to her, you're still here. Huh. And she said to him, and you're still here. Huh. And he said, it's changed, hasn't it? Wow. And then she said to me, black folks are disappearing. And I got really literally goosebumps when she said that. And I thought, this is what it's about. Exactly. This is about black folks disappearing from mm -hmm. tr tr traditionally black and brown neighborhoods. So what is that story? And how do we, ha how do we get those, those voices to tell the story um, rather than have it just be a, a reported piece, but to really amplify those voices? And I think oh, I'm, I'm very proud of it. It works very and proud. it's, it's yeah. just wonderful. Uh, uh, we always start by asking our guests to place him or herself in black America. And for you... Uh, and we know each other. And I said, <laughs> I need the abbreviated version. <laughs> and I said, I Rebecca. wish there was one. Let me see if I can figure that out. <laughs> you know, my, I placed myself in black. I literally placed myself in black America because uh, I was adopted into a white family and I was raised in a white town and I went to all white schools. Um, and I really, uh, the first thing I ever wrote, really, at probably nine, eight or nine years old, was a short essay. Um, my name is Rebecca Ann Carroll. I am a black child. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, it wasn't that my parents ever really said, you're black um, and things are going to be different or things are... I knew that I was black. I didn't know what it meant to be black. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know where I would be or how I would find my, my place in black America. Um, but it was, it was something, honestly, that was in my bones. Um, and I sought it out as, you know, when I felt that I could. But it was a, it right. was a long... But started, started writing when you were nine, and yeah. that was about being black. Yeah. And this was in New England that you yeah. grew up, and yeah. so you didn't really have a, a very, very complex story in terms of it, because we've seen you yeah. write about this yes. in very many ways, yeah. and it, difficult and complicated. So what is it like to be biracial now in America? I mean, have we, have we moved beyond that super complicated, ridiculous stage of it? <laughs> Super complicated, ridiculous, <laughs> tragic. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, and a lot, I think a lot of biracial people and particularly biracial adoptees will tell you we don't really use biracial so much because it doesn't really mean anything to anybody, particularly mm -hmm. the people who are racist. What they see <laughs> right. is, uh, is black skin. And so that I, you know, it's probably starting at about 2022, 20, you know, began to black identify. And, and that's sort of what I am. Um, now that I have a son who is mixed um, and he is, he calls himself black and biracial. 
um, which is sort of a new thing that you can be both. Mm -hmm. um, and I encourage that and, and, and foster that, whatever, however he wants to identify. But I think um, that, that biracial identity, as fraught as it has been in the past, is, um, is less fraught now, particularly because of this moment we are having where blackness is really kind of paramount. It's really kind mm -hmm. of setting the tone. Um, you know, and you, you, write, you write a lot about, about this, of how uh, there, there's a duality of the, the horribleness, you know, the tragedy, the violence that's being set upon in black America and this cultural ascendancy yeah. that, that you see. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, in the, in, the, in the years, the couple of years since Ferguson and Black Lives Matter, you know, we've seen this um, groundswell of, uh, of black cultural resilience um, and emboldened state of black identity. Um, and, and within that is all that we do and have always done, but in this kind of concentrated way, you know, the art that is happening, Ava DuVernay, the, uh, Roxane Gay, um, Ta-Nehisi, Claudia, I mean, the awards that are going to these people, the accolades, the, the agency that is being sort of owned mm -hmm. um, is, is, is powerful, really, really powerful. And I mean, I think about, um, that doesn't stop the violence for sure, mm -hmm. um, but it, but given the the way that we are building up mm -hmm. this kind of this kind of agency and this kind of power, really different than than the Black Power movement or the Civil mm -hmm. Rights movement, because it's really kind of like accept us as we are. You know, um, I, I saw a quote um, from one of the Black Lives Matter uh, movement founders who said, you know, we are, we're going to wear our pants saggy. You know, we're going um, to mm -hmm. bring our whole set. We're going to talk the way we want to talk. Mm -hmm. um, and we are going to be multidimensional. We are not a monolith and we're going to show up as we are. Um, and that's really, that's really different. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, and even your, your writing changed in, yeah. at a certain point, and it, it was did. after Ferguson and your, yeah. your now 11-year-old son, yeah. Kofi, uh, expressed some concern to you. Yeah, yeah. Well, after um, Mike Brown was shot and, and he and I marched together for the first time, um, my son Kofi and I, um, and he you know, made this little sign with Mike, just Mike Brown's name on it, and he said to me, are you going to get shot, Mom? Mm. Um, and then... For himself, he thought, well, what does this mean for me? You know, he is racially ambiguous looking, though he does black identify sure. and is regularly upset that and people gorgeous. don't identify him as black. <laughs> right. um, uh, and so I have always written about race. Mm -hmm. My work and my writing took on new meaning in, a, in a, just a very, very powerful, um, in an almost, I had almost a visceral response to mm -hmm. what my what my, um, what my responsibility was and what I was willing to endure and commit to. Um, so it became not, um, it became more about racial justice, uh, less about reflection, less about observation. And I think in some ways, I mean, that was when I really placed myself in black America. You know, I had been four years, mm -hmm. um, but I also felt that I had to, um, that I had to um, undo so much of the framework that I was raised um, around the white gaze, you know, so much in terms of beauty, in terms of uh, ideals and expectations and standards. And, you know, I mean, there was never any reference for me until I sought it out. And even then I felt, you know, like um, I, just, I just put myself around right. black people and I didn't right. so much know how to... Sure, but the, white, but the white gaze, yeah. you know, and I was asking you, because the first time I came across it was when Toni Morrison yeah. re referenced it, and yeah. I, did she start that? And I love what you said, is that she probably started everything, yeah, you know, yeah. before anybody else thought about anything, Toni Morrison did. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but uh, talk a little bit about the white gaze. Well, it's the, it, is the, it is the overarching default of America and framework of America, um, and it is, uh, it is, what looks upon us to, um, to issue acceptance um, and or unacceptance. Um, you know, and as I said, it's how you look, it's how you talk, it's how you behave, it's how you um, carry yourself. Um, 
it, and 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 I did you know it's very very it's it's in some ways very nuanced in other ways very macro you know right. I think Toni Morrison gave this a gave the answer when someone asked her why she didn't have white people <laughs> char white characters in yeah. her novels and she's like wait a minute you yeah. know yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm writing for me and right. for, for my there's that also that idea of of who are we doing stuff for right right, right. I mean, not just the acceptance but are we trying to deliver to a white audience? Because again, that is the overarching default. And I really think it's it's remarkable in 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 tandem with this ascendancy and the vi the violence that the, that we're talking about whiteness as a thing for the first time. Exactly, like, it's always been. It's blackness. always been, yeah. <laughs> and so it's now it's like the outing of white privilege, and right. we're talking about white identity as something that is that can be deconstructed, which is, I think, really healthy um, and, and um, hopeful. Um, and, and now that you mentioned the word deconstruction, yeah. I, wa I, wanna re I love your writing. I love your use of you. You know, words. And this was, uh, you wrote a piece about uh, Sarah Lewis's uh, Aperture mm -hmm. edition, which was just incredible with yeah. writers and yeah. artists and photographers. Uh, and at the end of it, he said, yet here we are as black artists and writers pushing forward in that struggle, which has always been long and arduous, showing up, turned up, and getting into formation. We're engaged in a critical culturally vigorous deconstruction of the perceived black monolith. This is your great writer. <laughs> and the white gaze that per perpetuates it. It is essentially the equivalence of a national collective clapback with vision for justice. Uh, explain the clapback. Well, you know, I mean, now, again, like I, like I said, you know, we have language. We do language. And this is what sort of what the series is about as well. It's, to me, it's based on Toni Morrison's, yes. my favorite Toni Morrison <laughs> quote, which is, we die, that may be the meaning of life, but we do language. That may be the measure of life. Huh. And, and we do. Black Americans do language. Um, and we have ways of talking to each other. We have vernacular, which has been uh, dismissed for years, but is now being actively sort of recruited um, in, in mainstream media and, and, um, uh, and just common folk, white right. folk using, you know, words like woke and bay and, and, right. and all of these things. Um, uh, but what was the original question? How, how yeah, the clap, the clap talk about, oh, the so clap back. So that. that's a word. That's yes. one of our words. <laughs> Right, no, and so right. we can say that. Being a we yes, can say yeah, that, yeah. and 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 be taken <laughs> seriously. And I and I do feel like it is this whole like, the the impact alone of Beyonce's Lemonade. I mean, right. it's it's a global phenomenon that is not just a pop performance. Bay was like, I'm going to be a feminist, y'all, <laughs> and and the impact right. has been extraordinary. Bay right. Beyonce fan or not, Bay Hive member or not, mm -hmm. you cannot ignore that she stepped out of what people expected her to be and she she owned it and she and she didn't ask for permission uh, now you the new series that you're that you're yeah. that you're doing which is with an audience and with a guest and talking mm -hmm. about race and language it all started uh when you did uh, uh some interviews at wnyc and mm -hmm. we've got a clip of one where where you're talking with chris jackson uh about tana he's coats Hey guys, nice to see you. Welcome Chris Jackson. Thank you. What a super pleasure it is to see you. Uh, back in my former life, I was an author um, and published several books uh, when Chris was just starting out and now look at you now. <laughs> um, what was not mentioned, but I know that you all know is that um, Chris is the editor um, of ta book, uh, Between the World and me. And uh, I know that it, it's often mentioned in the media when Chris is mentioned is that he is the editor of this book. And, but lest you think that there's too much of a placement on the fact that he is the editor of this book, ta wrote the book and Chris Jackson put it in people's hands. Um, and it has really become part of a moment in time right now when um, you know, Ta-Nehisi went on to win the book award, but also MacArthur Genius Grant. Uh, he is 
arguably our most famous public intellectual right now. Um, we are in the midst of the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. We are in the midst of um, a uh, social media movement. Um, uh, there's a real eye to blackness at the moment. And I wondered if you could speak to, because it just keeps sort of um, growing and what was it that first made you think that it was time to bring ta book out? Because I know that it came out a good bit earlier than you had planned. Right. Um. And you'll have to watch the show to get the answer to that. But I just, <laughs> I just wanted, because I just love the way you, you pose the questions and really get to the, to the heart of the matter. So that, uh, so that the guests, like Ethan Hawke is yeah. going to be a guest. Yeah. You're starting, start, you started with a white, white guy? Yeah, Talking about, right, okay. You know, right. Because you know who needs to be having this conversation? <laughs> white guys right. or white people. And also, uh, you know, I have, I, I'm friendly with Ethan. I've, kn I've known him for some time. And, and, and I think, you know, he is, he is someone who would probably consider himself socially, racially conscious. Um, he often uh, has mentioned to me when we run into each other, oh, I was just thinking about blah, blah, blah. It's always something about race. And I was just having a conversation with you in my head. And I said, well, why don't we have that conversation mm -hmm. in public? Mm -hmm. um, because I think that's really, really important. And also, you know, what what do people, particularly white people with a platform, really stand to lose mm -hmm. by making this a primary uh, mission and, and, and um, not necessarily a mission, it doesn't have to be a mission, but it certainly needs to be at the forefront of consciousness right now. Precisely, precisely. Now you were asked to uh, write uh, for New York Magazine, a big piece that's in the October 3rd issue. It's not that big. It's big, you know. It's big. <laughs> If you've written it, it's big. Oh, okay. Uh, but, but tell us about that and how it came about. So um, the editor, the executive editor um, reached out and asked me to contribute a piece to their Ob the Obama issue, um, special Obama issue, and asked if I would write about Michelle Obama. And as it turns out, I had just finished writing a big essay about Michelle for this new anthology that's coming out in January called The Meaning of Michelle, which is edited by Veronica, the great Veronica Chambers. The great Chambers, Veronica Chambers. Um, and great. has a, an intro by Ava DuVernay and, and a bunch of other writers. Sarah is one of the writers. Sarah and, Lewis, right, Damon right. Young, the great Damon Young, great. And Roxane Gay. Um, and so I said I've sort of blown my... <laughs> Michelle. <laughs> My Michelle. <laughs> right. But I'd really like to write about this dichotomous moment, this dichotomy of, as we've been talking about, the black cultural ascension, it, per particularly in, in um, the confluence of pop culture and art and, and activism, and these viral videos of black bodies being killed by police. Um, and she said that sounded good. And so then I was like, oh, now I have to write it and figure <laughs> out what that means. Right. Um, and so I felt like it, it, it was many, it's many things. I, and, I, and I think that I, I came to the conclusion that it was wrong to try to figure out what it means essentially, you know, like, you know, so that we can sort of, what, it's, what it feels to me is that black folks have harnessed a moment and sort of have, have harnessed a moment that reflects all of our, um, our beauty and nuance and, um, dynamism and um and just sort of moved forward with that um and and so it doesn't have to necessarily mean i don't think we know what it means yet i think right. it means we have an opportunity we're in the middle I think, of it i think yes. it means we have an opportunity right. and i think that kind of anything goes which is so so i so that's kind of what this this conversation series is about it's like okay well what if what if I asked Ethan Hawke? Or what if I asked, you know, um, Jackie Woodson? Or what if I asked, um, you know, any number of people? How do you talk about race mm -hmm. with your family, with your, your friends, in your working environment? How often do you talk about race? And why, wh wait, if you don't, why don't you? What right. are your fears about it? What do you stand to lose? Well, it, it, you are right in the... In in the forefront of all of this, and we couldn't have a better interpreter oh, uh, to, to, to carry us through that journey. Um, I've been looking at some of your uh, recent articles for The Guardian and for the LA Times, and now Colin uh, Kaepernick mm -hmm. uh, and, and his moment yes. uh, and what he started. Uh, he got a lot of blowback for yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, deserved or not? Not. I have a lot, I have a lot of love for Colin Kaepernick uh, because he was adopted, because he's biracial and he black identifies, but I don't know that he knew that. I mean, I don't know his backstory, although I did write about him about four years ago 
um, when his birth mother sort of came into mm. the scene at sort of the height of his career. Right, sure, sure um, take advantage? Yeah, or, yeah, sort of. And he said publicly, I'm not really interested in knowing her. And I was like, you know what, that is that is your right. You don't need to know her. You don't need to, you've got your fam, you, you're set with that. So in, in my experience, it's, it's a sort of parallel experience, which is that you you are trying to figure out how to be black in the world, make a contribution, own it without feeling or looking like a fraud. Um, and so what's great for Colin, I think, is that he, he's making this choice at a time when there's so much more acceptance. I mean, yes, he, he, he experienced a blowback in there where folks were like, he's not even black and so on and so forth. Right. But the majority really embraced his um, his own activism and how he decided to do it, and that's going down on one knee when that's right when the anthem is that's being, right, and and played. he and articulating precisely why he was doing it. Now, what about Leslie Jones? You've written about about her, and yeah. this is this this incorporates so much yeah. online hatred and a black hatred, uh, the whole uh, um, everything in yeah. one you know horrible story for yeah. uh, for a human being to yeah. go through this kind of. Yeah, insult. I mean, and for Leslie Jones, I think, and I and I wrote about this in particular because she is not the conventional. Again, this is what you know the, the sure. New York Times said of Viola Davis a few years ago: not traditionally beautiful or conventionally beautiful. That's the white gaze. Mm -hmm. That is the Precisely. white gaze, and Precisely. we internalize that. Whether you know, it, there are measures of internalizing it. I internalized it deeply because I gr was raised in a white framework. Leslie Jones, I think, uh, and, and so I expect it to a certain extent. I think Leslie Jones is very, very um, in and about her blackness and who she is and her own beauty and her own resilience. And so I think it takes her like, like off guard, like, what are you talking about? How could, you know, this is just pure evil. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it is evil. But I, I was struck by her, by the way in which she was surprised, I guess, um, but then was able to to tap into the the resources and and the um, and the encouragement um, and the support to come and got, to come yes. back got, into got the support. world. Yeah, this is so ridiculous. Yeah. Now you're a critic at large uh, at the uh, at the L.A. Times, and I love your book reviews. And you did Colson Whitehead's Underground. Woo. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> and what, the way you said, the way you expressed, you know, your words were like, oh, those were the slaves escaping. But it's also, you feel it as a reader going through. Yeah. Have you read it? I have not. It's sitting oh. at the top of my my stack now. I keep looking at it, but after I read your review, yeah. I was a little afraid to launch into it, but I will. It is so necessary. Again, it is at this time when our, for, for us, for, for black folks, we are in this kind of both emboldened and tender and vulnerable moment, right? Where we are looking at and revealing our, our you know, sort of deepest selves. Um, and, and so to, to go into this world, you know, obviously he's not the first person to write about slavery or the slave experience, but to go into this world. I know there were many people who said, not again, you know. You know we well, we I'll tell you what, it's, again? it's really like but, nothing I've ever read. And to go into that, to that experience and the way that Colson wrote it um, feels like, uh, it just feels like y y these are your peers, <laughs> you know, it, like really not just our people, but our peers. Um, and that was just deeply, deeply moving for me. Hmm. Well, when I have a, when I go on vacation, I'm going to read that. It's not really a vacation <laughs> read, Carol. I don't know if I recommend that. I, just, I need, I think I need yeah. space for that. Now you've written, uh, well, so many books, you know, and uh, as you were describing yourself in that interview with uh, Chris Jackson, you said, I used to be a writer. Yeah. <laughs> of an books, author. An, an author, author of books. And yeah. I, uh, will you be again? Yeah, I don't know. Every time I start thinking about um, about the, the amount of time that it takes um, and the focus, and um, you know, I my journey, um, such as it is, has never really been a linear path. Um, it has always been based um, in conversations. It has always been based in art um, and creativity and language, writing, race. Um, and so it's taken, you know, many, many forms. I've worked in across mediums. I've worked in television and film and online, and, online right. and Every, um, yeah. you know. Uh, and so, if if a uh, if the opportunity to write a book that feels right comes about, and I and I feel like I'm not just writing it because 
I should write another book, mm -hmm. um, then I would love to. But I, I, I would really love to write a novel, but I don't feel like I have, I don't know, novel writing's hard. Novel writing's really hard. That's right, yes, yeah. yes. Well, ask Toni Morrison. Yeah, no, great. I mean. But it probably comes. But I don't think it, it's hard for her. I really <laughs> That's don't. That's the wrong example, yeah. precisely, <laughs> with Toni. Yeah. So one of the things that I do want to mention is that you are a tremendous mentor to so many young people who are trying to write and trying to make their way in all kinds of fields. What? You know, what uh, prompts you to do that? Because so many people in your position will be saying, I, I'm sorry, I don't have time. It's really, um, it's, it's a joy. And it's also, um, I think, you know, again, I grew up without a lot of um, black, certainly black women role models. I mean, when I discovered Maya Angelou and I thought, I, I, this is what I need, <laughs> um, I sort of decided that I wanted to be the black woman that I needed. Um, both for myself and for, for other black women, um, young black women. And so it's really, it's a joy. And I think if I can be that, that kind of role model, um, then, I, then, well, then why else? Thank you so much for doing it because so many people have said, yes, Rebecca, and she's actually spent time with me and actually <laughs> helped me. Um, we always ask our guests as we're finishing to uh, finish this, the statement, the power of the strength of black America lies in. What, what is that for you? The power and the strength of black America lies, lies in. in our resilience and our, and our beauty and our art and our, and our foundational contribution to this country. And do you see that this is the moment that that resilience more than anything else is coming through? I think it has, it has always come through, you know? I mean, we're, we were not meant to be here, um, much less thrive. But, I, w but what I'm seeing is a kind, of, um, a kind of audacity and strength and, um, and a, a, kind of, a kind of willful um, embrace of who we are and without, without asking for permission or, or acceptance. Well, thank you so much for, for being here. It's, it's been a tremendous uh, time to talk with you about all of your projects and good luck with them, with them all. And thanks to you out there for watching as well. I'm Carol Jenkins. The show is Black America and we'll see you the next time.